Hi, this is a quick revision of uh, Carolyn Duffy's Dream of a Lost Friend. First thing to recognise is the title itself, uh, The Lost Friend, is euphemistic. Uh, there's a sense in which the poet doesn't feel able to confront the true horror of the situation. Uh, there's a distancing um, that can be conveyed through that euphemism. In terms of the structure, we've got regular sestets running throughout the poem. And that could be said to suggest the inevitability of death, um, the progress of the disease that's unrelenting. Uh, time is marching on all the way through. In terms of time, they feature quite heavily in the poem. If you have a look at the first sentence, um, you were dead but we met dreaming before you had died. There's a confusion of tenses there. We've got the past tense verb met followed by dreaming in the present continuous. So those two verbs are juxtaposed in a way in which they clash and seem awkward. The past and the present are confused. And that can reflect the confusing uh, mixing of the dream state and reality. So the person that she's meeting, the friend, is dead, but is being met in this dream in the present. If we have a look at uh, the way in which the confusion is created, partly it can be through the caesura. Uh, you were dead, but we met, dreaming. So the caesura forces a pause and creates a degree of ambiguity. We're forced to regard kind of polysemic ideas. You know, there's a possibility of a couple of different meanings. And that's also true down here. Then you turned pale. If you look at the, ces the caesura, then you turned, as if the friend is turning round. But we can't avoid the collocation of turned pale, as if in fear or through illness. And that caesura helps to create that ambiguity. Ending with unwell, unwell again seeming very euphemistic given the situation of the uh, person dying or now being dead. Uh, a public building where I've never been and on the wall an AIDS poster is our first clue that the person is dead because they contracted AIDS. And then this line's interesting in terms of your white lips. It's a fractured sentence. All we've got there is the noun phrase. Um, we could argue perhaps that it represents the kind of uh, debilitating aspects of the disease, that the fractured sentence, the way it's broken down, could reflect the way in which uh, the person has uh, wasted away themselves. They're almost just uh, left as represented by the lips themselves, lips that are, are bloodless, white lips. Throughout the poem, we get an intrusion of uh, direct speech. My dear, my dear, must this be? Now, initially, we're uncertain whose voice this is, but uh, given that uh, we have help me here, and some of the other references to direct speech in the poem, it seems as if it's going to be the poetic voices language that's running through. Second stanza. We embrace standing in a long corridor which harboured a fierce pain. Uh, that fierce pain, uh, metaphorically describing presumably the loss or the guilt. The words you spoke were frenzied prayers to chemistry. It seems like a strange juxtaposition, this uh, prayers to chemistry. Uh, normally you would uh, create those as kind of binary opposites, the religious and the scientific. So to put the two together seems odd. Um, we can probably resolve that by thinking about it as the um, dying friend placing all their hope in uh, the kind of uh, medical advances that may solve or deal with the issues that are created by uh, AIDS. Or you laughed, a child man's laugh. And that oxymoron, child, man, child man's, suggests again a, a difficulty, um, a tension. Um, oxymorons are always by their very nature um, tense, as in they don't go together, it doesn't work, there's an awkwardness there, and there's something wrong. And clearly there is something wrong with this situation, both in terms of the illness and in terms of the way in which the past is intruding on the present. Innocent, hysterical, out of your skull. It's an interesting choice of words, particularly given that a skull clearly has very strong connotations of death. Um, there's something haunting and disturbing about the choice of the word skull. It's also, out of your skull, drawing on the vernacular of drug taking. Not recreational drug taking, but the sense in which this um, character has constantly had to take drugs in order to improve the effects of the illness. It's only a dream, I heard myself saying, only a bad dream. In the third stanza, AIDS is personified. Uh, we've got um, this um, purposeful enemy. 
as if it has its own volition. It's attacking people on purpose. And then this description of AIDS as this personified figure is contrasted to, in fashionable restaurants over the crudités, the healthy imagine a time when all these careful moments will be dreamed and dreamed again. Again, there's that motif of dreaming that's running through. Um, I wonder, and I'm not sure about this, but I wonder whether the choice of crudités to be the only thing that's mentioned in terms of the meal is purposeful in terms of it having some kind of homophonic pun within it. Um, crudités as in crude things as well as the kind of raw vegetables that are eaten at, at times in restaurants. So if that is the case, and again I'm not entirely convinced by this, um, then we might want to wonder what these crude ideas are. Is it the, you know, the crudeness of the horror of such an invasive illness, a disease that uh, is, is a kind of purposeful enemy being present in this kind of refined company? Personally, I don't think that choice is accidental. The meal motif continues into the final stanza. Then, as I slept, she backed away from me, crying and offering a series of dates for lunch, waving. I missed your funeral. There's a poignancy there in the sense that the poetic voice now is articulating the kind of guilt that we've maybe suspected over the course of the poem. I missed your funeral. She wasn't able to be there. I said, no, you couldn't hear. At the end of the corridor, phones up, acting. The person is uh, putting on a brave face. Where there's life, and then we get this elision. Uh, where there's life uh, collocates, where there's life, there's hope. But there's hope is elided, it's removed, perhaps suggesting that hope is abandoned at this stage as well. Even this idiomatic phrase that's kind of throwaway, oh, where there's life, there's hope, is rejected. She can't bring herself to even articulate this because there is no hope. Awake, alive once, I think of you, almost hopeful, almost. Again, there's this sense in which, you know, it's within reach, but still hope is, is lost. 